Hello, everyone. Welcome to the, our third keynote of the conference. Um, we are very happy and uh, delighted to have Peter Wagner with us uh, tonight. And we are going to proceed like this after this, my welcoming notes. Uh, Julien de Bonville is actually going to introduce Peter to you. After that, Peter will have the floor for um, about 45 minutes, one hour. And after that, I'm going to the, the, the screen is going to come back to me so I can start the discussion. While well, Julian, you have the time to, to type your questions in the Q&A. Although we ask you to type your questions in the Q&A, we expect you also to be able to, to, to say, if you've been to the previous uh, keynotes, you know that you've been allowed to actually speak out loud your, your questions. Unfortunately, in the webinar, it's not possible to actually see you but we really enjoyed at least hearing you. So please don't be shy and you can actually start including your questions as they come um, in the Q&A. So with that said, I give uh, the floor. I'm Graciela Moray Silva. I probably should have said that in the beginning. Um, I'm a professor at the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies. With that said, I give the floor to my co-chair, uh, Julian de Bonville. <laughs> Thank you, Graciela. Hello, everyone. Um, as Coachella mentioned, we have the great pleasure to welcome Peter Wagner as one of the keynote speakers of this Congress. Before giving him the floor, if I may say, I would like to briefly introduce Peter Wagner and his work. Peter Wagner is a former professor of social and political theory at the European University Institute of Florence, a former professor of sociology and, uh, at the University of Warwick and the University of Trento. He also held various visiting positions in different prestigious universities in Europe, South Africa, and the United States. He is currently a research professor of social sciences at the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies and at the University of Barcelona. Peter Wagner's research is rooted in the fields of comparative, historical, and political sociology, social and political theory, and sociology of social sciences. More specifically, his work focuses on the comparative analysis of different forms of modernity and of the historical trajectories of modern societies. As he underlines, the term modernity does not refer to a single and unique model of social organization, but rather to various interpretations of basic human challenges in the light of specific historical experiences. Over the past few years, he has been exploring the tensions between struggles for autonomy and persisting form of domination related to modernity, as well as current possibilities of progress in the light of various historical experiences in different world regions. Regarding these uh, theoretical issues, Peter Wagner has published various books. His recent publication includes the book called Collective Actions and Political Transformation, The Entangled Experiences in Brazil, South Africa and Europe, published with Aurea Mota in 2019. I also would like to mention the book European Modernity, A Global Approach, published in 2017 with Bo Strass. I hope I pronounced it properly. And finally, the book called Progress, A Reconstruction, published in 2015. We have now the great pleasure of listening to Peter Wagner for a conference called Reviewing the Trajectories of Modernity, Biophysical Resources, socio-ecological transformation, and the question of global justice. Dear Peter, thank you again for accepting our invitation. The floor is now yours. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Graciela and uh, Julien, for the invitation, first of all, and um, for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, speak to you and with you today. It would be even nicer to do that in Geneva in co-presence, but uh, maybe we'll have to wait for such an occasion to do that maybe sometime in the future. Um, let me start out uh, by uh, trying to explain to you what the question is and what the problem is I would like to address in this um, presentation today. Um, you all know about um, the notion of the Anthropocene, uh, the idea that um, the planet Earth has moved into a new epoch uh, and the one in which the, it is the activity of human beings that shapes the geological, the biogeological conditions of the planet. Now, uh, this um, uh, 
uh, proposal for renaming our epoch uh, comes from the earth sciences um, and it translates in as we all know uh, the current debate about uh, climate change and the urgency to do something about that and they are normally connected uh, through uh, uh, some understanding of the use of biophysical resources by human beings on the planet with a special spe special focus on fossil fuels i will come back later to um, that in detail to the focus on fossil fuels now uh, accepting that as a starting point um, if we look slightly more closely, uh, we can see without great problems that the systematic exploitation of fossil fuels uh, by human beings starts in the late 18th century uh, with coal mining, uh, coal mining and iron processing, uh, something which is sometimes called the first vertical frontier that is explored in contrast to the or in distinction from the horizontal frontiers that human beings have been exploring and exploiting over centuries before. Uh, in which is more conventionally called the Industrial Revolution. And this use of fossil fuels accelerates significantly in the second half of the 20th century, uh, from the end of the Second World War onwards, in what is now called the Great Acceleration. Now, having said that, having translated the broader notion of the Anthropocene into uh, historical timing and dating of fossil fuel use, we see that uh, the periodization, which is in the background of the Anthropocene, at least somewhat, uh, overlaps considerably with the one normally applied in the sociological and historical analysis of modernity, where the onset of modernity is most often located around uh, in the decades around 1800. There is some debate, which we could take up later on if you want, uh, about looking at early modernity, about looking at the so-called voyages of discoveries from the late 15th century onwards. But the main dating uh, of the onset of modernity remain the period, the decades around 1800. And then the decades after the Second World War are often seen in the in a mainstream view, you might say, uh, as the period of consolidation of modernity, the period of modern societies, as Tucker Parsons would call them. So there is a considerable overlap uh, between these two ways of looking at human and planetary history. However, there has been extremely little concern for biophysical resources in the standard analysis of modernity. And indeed, for that reason, those who emphasize the Anthropocene as the current uh, human condition, human and planetary condition, uh, in the historical and social sciences, they often argue that this new condition spells the end of the modern self-understanding. Uh, many of you, most of you, uh, will have heard or read the works by Deepa Shakabati on the one hand, or by Bruno Latour on the other, in rather different ways. They both suggest there is some end of a modern self-understanding or the necessity for thinking differently uh, than the conventional way of modernity because of the Anthropocene condition. So that is my question then. How can the analysis of modernity be related to uh, the notion of the Anthropocene, to the thesis that goes with the notion of the Anthropocene? And I will do that um, not in grand terms about the relation between nature and human beings, as it is sometimes done, uh, but rather more practically, you may want to say operationally, uh, I want to ask what happens with the analysis of modernity when we try to give adequate attention to biophysical resources. So that's basically, that's the problem. And I want to address it in three parts and three sections. The first one is rather conceptual. The second is historical. And the third one, more briefly, is social philosophical, namely addressing the question of justice, which is, um, as I understand it, a common theme that holds together the contributions to this Congress. Now, um, in the conceptual part, um, I will reflect on what we mean by modernity and by its trajectories and how they have been represented and analyzed until now, so to say, before the emergence of the Anthropocene thesis. In the second section, I want to show slightly tentatively for reasons of time, but also for reasons of the state of research, how the account of modernity will change once the human use of biophysical resources is systematic, systematically introduced. And I want to argue, I anticipate that, uh, 
uh, that it indeed can be changed, that we can go on talking about modernity, but altering uh, this understanding considerably by systematically integrating the use of biophysical resources. And then thirdly, as already mentioned, I want to briefly address the impact of this change on how we uh, consider the question of global justice today. So that's the agenda, basically. Let me start with the notion of modernity. Um, some of you uh, will still be familiar with the late 20th century debate about modernity, uh, triggered, uh, one might say, by Jean-François Lyotard. Um, with his little book on the postmodern condition. Um, I will not, I will come back to it briefly later now, but I will not uh, rediscuss this debate, which um, in an important respect is indeed over. It uh, ended maybe at the beginning of this century. Uh, it petered out, one might say. I rather want to concentrate uh, on the significance of the, uh, of the term of modernity for um, uh, sociological or maybe historical sociological research. Um, if we do that, then we see that this uh, requires us as sociologists, or maybe also as historians, uh, to take a focus on social phenomena of large scale and long duration, which have always been in the center of the sociological tradition, or always, maybe for a long time, namely phenomena such as capitalism, state formation, democracy, democracy bureaucracy, and others. Uh, secondly, I have already hinted at that, uh, most of the sociological tradition indeed assumes that there has been one major rupture around 1800 uh, and that it is from there indeed that the sociological reasoning starts out, also historical in terms of the uh, emergence of sociology as a social science discipline. And thirdly, uh, if we look back um, at this, then we see that a considerable part of uh, the analysis has focused on trends or tendencies of social change uh, which followed up on this major rupture around 1800. A change that has been cast in terms of individualization, rationalization, secularization, democratization, commodification, alienation, and maybe a few others once we think about it. Uh, in the 1960s, they have converged, at least for some thinkers, um, around the term modernization, which included aspects of all of this. Uh, but maybe most significantly, uh, the two trends of individualization and rationalization have been those that have been diagnosed also by thinkers of otherwise different orientations, either more affirmative or more critical. Now, having stated that, let me make two observations uh, starting out from this ultra brief overview about uh, what we mean by modernity and sociology. Uh, the first is uh, the notion, uh, which is now already also a bit older, uh, that indeed this whole approach of trends and tendencies is not really viable any longer. If one takes a closer look, almost all of these terms are very difficult to operationalize, to turn them into phenomena that indeed we can observe or maybe also measure. Um, the, um, for some it may work better than for others, um, but some of them are very difficult to measure at all, and others, if we try to measure them, we may find out that they're actually not these linear trends that are often postulated. This may be, some of you will know this, uh, has been most forcefully argued by Raymond Boudon uh, in his book from the 1950, uh, 1970s, La Place du Désordre, where the whole first chapter was devoted basically to uh, frontal criticism of all uh, analysis of these long-term tendencies. Now, one may even say that as a consequence of this criticism, not only of Boudon's type, but of criticism of many different kinds, um, that uh, much of this um, research and theorizing about phenomena of uh, the large scale and the long duration has indeed been abandoned or sidelined in sociology. Uh, I want to argue that the conclusion should, be, should not be of that kind, that we, for methodological or conceptual reasons, need to abandon this kind of research, but that we need a more nuanced historical comparative sociology which in a sense started out with Max Weber's work on the comparative history of world religions, on which the multiple modernities debate builds in the 1990s. Uh, 
uh, or also if we go back to debates in the US around Charles Tilly, Theda Scotchpole, or then William Sewell, um, where um, such a nuanced historical comparative sociology was developed, uh, but is not very strongly continued. I want to argue that we should not give up on this, that we indeed uh, should sustain an interest, because if we don't do that as social scientists, uh, others will do it and will, they will do it badly, uh, to understand the long-term development of our societies, that we should aim at developing something like a causal narrative about this long duration, in which the notion of trajectory uh, indeed uh, points to uh, a long duration, but which is not just linear, uh, but where one looks out for the mechanisms that uh, trigger change or the events that set societies on a different course and bring it in a different structure. It is in this sense that I might in the following occasionally use the term narrative for various ways of constructing uh, such a view of long-term developments of large phenomena. That's the first remark. And the second remark then makes this more concrete, um, where I want to suggest that indeed uh, there are uh, what Wolfgang Knobel once called theories that won't pass away. You can criticize them as much and as forcefully as you want. Uh, they subside, but then they revive in a different form. Uh, Knobel has said this about modernization theory, which has been killed off many times, but uh, it always comes back. It doesn't pass away. And something similar is also true for the theory of uh, capitalism. Uh, I will come back to both of these notions. I will discuss them briefly now and then come back to them later as well. Now, what are the guiding assumptions of these two main approaches, which some may call the affirmative and the critical approach to the understanding of the long-term development of our societies? Well, the one, the mainstream view of modernity or of modernization goes with notions of freedom and reason, which come out of enlightenment thinking. They can be uh, translated into more sociological discourse uh, in the notion of uh, the individual and individualization on the one hand and rationality and rationalization on the other, into autonomy and mastery. That's a term uh, the Franco-Greek philosopher Cornelius Castoriadis used. Or if you think like Harcourt Parsons, you think of institutionalized freedom and functional differentiation going together. Or again, in a different way, uh, the recent book by Pierre Chabonnier, which talks about abundance and liberty as two guiding ideas of uh, social and political philosophy, maybe in his terms. So that is the, that's one angle to look at modernity in the light of concepts of this kind. Um, let's say autonomy and mastery has been for me the, uh, the one that is most useful, uh, but they all in a sense address the same kind of problem. Very often and often rightly so, uh, analysis of modernity in this light have been criticized as being uh, way too linear, uh, evolutionist, also affirmative sort of uh, defending and praising uh, our own societies in terms of their achievements be it normative achievements in terms of liberty or functional achievements in terms of uh, satisfying human needs. But what is important here, what is important, I share much of that criticism, but what needs to be kept in mind is that what has been done in this kind of theorizing and research is to affirm uh, that uh, normative uh, commitments indeed uh, can have a force in history. They can be a component a, dynamic, a part of the dynamics of social change. And that is indeed, now we come back to the debate of the late 20th century, where uh, the, the, the sociological debate about modernity became more open and richer, uh, namely where modernity was no longer understood as a linear path of institutional developments to higher forms, so to say, uh, but uh, in the light of, again, using Castoriadis' term of social imaginaries, of the self-understandings that societies uh, give themselves and in the light of which they organize themselves. In this light, from the 1990s onwards, uh, one had no longer this single view of modernity, but one could look at transformations of modernity, that modernity can indeed considerably change form. One can also look at varieties of interpretations of modernity, that is the whole multiple modernities debate uh, triggered by uh, Schmuleisenstadt, uh, and increasingly also 
uh, an angle on global modernity, what some call global modernity, uh, which basically breaks with the idea that modernity is something that develops in the West of Europe and from there uh, diffuses across the world, that indeed uh, the self-understanding of modernity is one which is global from the beginning, uh, but has different backgrounds, interpretations and experiences. So while from my own point of view, uh, there has been a considerable enrichment of the understanding of modernity in all of these debates, uh, but uh, it remains true what critics now say that there has been no serious concern for the role of biophysical resources. If one looks more closely uh, at the whole debate, the sociological and maybe even proto-sociological debate uh, about um, so-called modern societies, one sees indeed uh, that very often the basic assumption is that there is an underlying instrumental concept of nature, uh, that indeed what is modern and uh, what mastery means and not in modern terms means the increasing ability of human beings to exploit nature for uh, their own purposes, but in a purely instrumental way and without much sense of uh, the limits of such an endeavor. Well, that was a brief reconstruction of that part of the um, uh, of the dualism of understandings of modernity. A quick look, uh, and I will come back to that later in more detail, at the other side, the critical side, which um, uh, you can summarize as critical social theory if you want. Uh, much of that indeed uh, is related with an analysis of capitalism, uh, whether of Marxist inspiration or not, uh, where indeed it's not uh, the striving for uh, freedom and functional superiority in any sense, uh, but a dynamics of uh, class antagonism and class struggle that drives social change, uh, where indeed commodification becomes the key term, and where importantly, um, there is for that reason also the underlying assumption of an inherent expansionism of uh, capitalist modern societies, if I uh, say it like that, that indeed in contrast to the mainstream line, um, the critical line cannot develop any sense of modernity stabilizing because of the underlying both uh, the competition among capitalist enterprises and the class struggle uh, between uh, capitalists and workers. Uh, there is uh, an underlying expansionist tendency which is first discussed from the end of the 19th century onwards as imperialism, and where in the recent debates, uh, very often uh, uh, thinkers go back to Rosa Luxemburg's work uh, under the heading of Landnahme, seizure of land. Uh, they are then able to um, uh, not only in some strands look at tendencies of ever further commodification, but also more specifically uh, at expanding into the space of nature, so to say, um, now, um, well, maybe let me say one more uh, word about that, uh, just to give an idea. Uh, what you see there, um, what I relate with this understanding is on the one hand, uh, all the work on ecologically unequal exchange, uh, which comes out of the world systems approach, um, that part of the critical analysis of global modernity, if I use that term. Uh, and on the other hand, and more recently, uh, works that uh, under titles like Fossil Capital by uh, Andreas Malm, uh, which look uh, exactly at uh, the use of biophysical resources at fossil fuels to see how they have become uh, an underlying condition for capitalist development and the way in which capitalism uh, both reproduces itself and transforms itself. Now, uh, so there is in the critical analysis of modernity in the broad sense, uh, including both the affirmative and the critical view. Um, in the critical view, there is, at least over the past 20 years or so, maybe a bit more even, there is more of a sense uh, of the significance of biophysical resources than in the, let's call it the mainstream view or the view that uses the term modernity uh, rather than the term capitalism. Uh, but uh, there is still a strong guiding prior assumption, uh, which is related to the mainstream view, namely that it also presupposes an instrumental relation to nature, only that in the, capital, in the capitalism analysis, this is not a general attitude of human beings, but it's the attitude of the bourgeoisie, uh, 
and it is because the bourgeoisie is hegemonic and imposes itself, it becomes the driving underlying dynamics uh, of our societies, um, so that the, uh, the core, this instrumental concept of nature, uh, is also assumed in the critical narrative. So this is the point then where the more broadly understood Anthropocene narrative enters, where indeed then um, at least some proponents of that concept, like Deepa Shakapati, uh, have also argued against this notion that capital is the driving force. One should not talk about capitalocene, as some others have proposed, uh, but um, uh, because that would be an insufficient, in, uh, in uh, not, not wrong, but inadequate, not fully developed understanding of what is, has been happening over the past two centuries. So that that's, states the question. Uh, it states that there is a problem uh, uh, overall in the understanding of modernity, including the understanding of capitalism, uh, with the way uh, the human use of biophysical resources uh, is analyzed. So let me then come to the second part of the presentation, uh, trying to um, uh, remedy this, uh, at least in the form of a sketch, uh, trying to show what needs to be done. Well, partly it has been done, and I can point to um, uh, references. Maybe I do that mostly rather later in the discussion if you want, but maybe it's some passing references I will throw in. And partly it is work that needs to be done that is not yet really done and that one should embark on. Uh, to start this, let me say, uh, partly for reasons of uh, clarity and simplicity, um, I will focus on fossil fuels and carbon dioxides. Uh, this is obviously the way in which uh, the climate change debate has globally been focused, uh, not least due to the work of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There is much that can be said about the way this focus has developed, uh, both positively, in the sense that indeed it has provided a focus for this debate, which otherwise would have remained unfocused probably, uh, but also one can see it critically as uh, limiting the perspective, limiting the horizon on, on the problem. But uh, in the second part of my presentation, I will adopt this perspective and look at fossil fuels. Now, in terms of the broad in environmental history, uh, this is relatively straightforward. Um, even though I make it even more schematic in this presentation, the, um, it is rather straightforward. Uh, namely, we can, from 1800 to the present, uh, uh, single out uh, four important moments, uh, moments of transformation. I've already mentioned the first, uh, the period around 1800, the exploration of uh, the first vertical frontier uh, with uh, coal mining and iron processing. The second moment is the period around 1900, a century later, uh, with uh, what um, the economist and environmental historian Edward Barbier has called the second vertical frontier with oil and gas. Um, and then we move ahead in the 20th century and look at uh, the so-called Great Acceleration, where I would like to introduce a distinction between two phases. That's why I arrive at four um, significant moments. Uh, the first phase of the Great Acceleration, uh, which means really the full establishment of a fossil fuel regime uh, from the end of the Second World War onwards uh, until the 1970s, which uh, Jean Forestier has called the Trente Glorieuses, the 30 glorious years of um, well, in his view, French, but overall West European or Western development, which is indeed uh, looking with hindsight uh, characterized by the full establishment of a fossil fuel regime. Uh, and then a second phase of great acceleration, uh, which uh, starts maybe in the 1990s, periodization is always a bit open, we can always discuss that in more detail, uh, namely, uh, when the, uh, the moment when the emphasis of acceleration uh, shifts uh, spatially uh, to East Asia and to some extent South Asia. So these are the main uh, fossil fuel events, if you want to call it like that, or moments. What I will now try to do is first introduce that in a broader, uh, to give a sense of what a, so a socio-ecological transformation is, one that tries to bring uh, these moments of transformation in biophysical resource use into a broader historical sociology. 
Now, as regards to the first, first moment, uh, there is broad consensus in economic history that this is the moment of, uh, well, as it used to be called, the takeoff of Europe, uh, or since kind of Pomeranz, the moment of the great divergence, uh, when indeed uh, Europe gradually go, grows richer and diverges from all other world regions. Importantly, that's the key of that argument, even from world regions which uh, about which one can say through historical analysis that they differed very much from Europe um, uh, before. These are in particular some regions of China uh, and also some regions of India where you can put this more or less strongly, but where it would have been difficult uh, to see, say, looking at 1750, why Western Europe should diverge and those regions not. Um, that is what Pomeranz and then later economic historians try to investigate. Now, um, the debate is open and it will probably never be entirely concluded, not for lack of evidence reasons, but for um, the difficulty of establishing strong causal connections. Uh, but it seems, I give a specific emphasis here, which other scholars would put differently, but uh, it seems undeniable that the availability of coal in proximity to production centers in Western Europe, first in England and uh, Belgium, uh, overall Northwestern Europe, uh, was one key element. And the other key element was um, the development of Atlantic trade uh, before, indeed, over the preceding three centuries, and that is actually one of the reasons why one could date the onset of modernity also around 1500, uh, because that means the um, development of uh, triangular Atlantic trade, uh, where basically uh, African labor uh, was working on American soil uh, and freed uh, workers in Europe for industrial production. Uh, they many less workers in Europe uh, produced food uh, because um, the combination of African labor and American soil uh, took care of that and eased what one could call the Malthusian constraint. This uh, enabled um, economic growth in Europe uh, through this combination. So what is important to say um, in addition though is that this great divergence actually didn't change the, or at least not for the better, the living conditions of most Europeans very quickly. Uh, there is recent work, uh, partly from a world systems perspective, but partly also from a more straight uh, global statistical perspective, uh, which asserts that uh, if you look in the middle of the 19th century, uh, you will see that the material living conditions um, across the globe were actually quite similar uh, except that in Europe, there was a huge divide between the rich and the poor, which means there was a minority of Europeans, which was very rich, uh, and they stood out, but the majority of the world population was more or less equally poor, still by the middle of the 19th century. Um, Branko Milanovic or uh, Roberto Patricio Kosinevich, uh, are, these are two different approaches, but they both agree uh, on this kind of finding, Whereas uh, a century later, by the late 20th century, uh, there is this very strong divide which um, uh, between, well, what we come to call the global north and the global south, um, or what was earlier called the first and the third world, or the developed world and the developing countries. But this is a phenomenon of the 20th century. Uh, that is what I would like to underline because that leads me uh, to the, um, the second period, the second moment, uh, the period around 1900 uh, and the exploration and systematic exploitation of the second vertical frontier with oil and gas. As many of you will know, some scholars call this now the period of first globalization, uh, whereas the one we used to call globalization in the late 20th century then becomes the second. You can even number that differently if you want. But um, if we look at this period, uh, we see indeed from the resource angle that it is um, based on the exploration of oil and gas. Uh, Barbier, whom I referred to earlier, um, called this the golden age of resource-based development. Uh, and he underlines that uh, the great divide between Europe and actually North America in this case as well, uh, and the rest of the world emerges then uh, 
or if you take the global historian Jürgen Osterhammel in his uh, transformation of the world, he talks about a deep energy divide uh, that emerges at the end of the 20th century, not earlier, at the, at the end of the 19th century, not earlier, not the early 20th century. <clears throat> now, at the same time, this period is one uh, where we have large scale emigration from Europe uh, to America, to Southern Africa, to Australia, also emigration until the US stopped it from China to America to the USA. Um, and at the same time, we have uh, a period of intense state formation in various world regions. Um, uh, and this means that uh, political institutions uh, stabilized and consolidated uh, in different ways. They uh, consolidated in Europe uh, as a combination uh, of the um, uh, new resource frontier and its uh, enablements uh, and uh, the, um, uh, uh, the emigration, emigration, the reduction of the population as um, uh, states where um, social inclusion uh, increased uh, relatively rapidly. Whereas, for instance, Latin American states or um, uh, the uh, Republic of South Africa, then um, the Union of South Africa at that moment, they consolidated their statehood as well, uh, but in very inegalitarian hierarchical forms. So uh, we have there uh, indeed a, a political institutional divide and a social economic divide that is related to the divide in resource use as it emerges with uh, the use of the fossil fuels, oil and gas. Now, it is this um, transformation at around 1800 uh, that we can, could say um, it creates the conditions for the developments in the later 20th century. I say conditions um, because uh, in the first half of the 20th century, um, the um, uh, let's say the possibilities that uh, existed in those conditions, they did not come to full fruition. Um, they are related to what we have come to call Fordism and consumer capitalism, uh, but they come to full fruition only in the second half of the 20th century after the Second World War. Uh, when uh, in North America and in Northwestern Europe, partly thanks to the Marshall Plan, uh, there are these phenomena which have been called economic miracle, the glorious 30 years, uh, the democratic welfare state with a high commitment to social equality. And at this, this is all very well known, uh, but now we need to add to this, that this is the context of the great acceleration, in particular uh, of oil use. Now, the same period sees decolonization in India and Africa, and it sees these inegalitarian growth strategies in Latin America and uh, South Africa. Um, I'll look a bit at the timing. Yes, no, I think it can go on. Um, now, if we look then more closely, there is the period from the middle of the 1970s to the 1990s, which is a period of uh, uncertain stabilization and stagnation in North America and Western Europe, uh, but also the one where um, uh, the new international division of labor emerges, where um, those regions of the world start to deindustrialize, where industrial production moves to other parts of the world, especially to uh, East Asia. Um, and uh, then I speak still mostly in social economic terms. You will see why that is important in a moment. Um, and uh, then we have from the 1990s to the present, uh, we have a stabilization. Uh, it's it already a bit earlier with these um, uh, precarious, these crisis movements. We have a stabilization of fossil fuel use and uh, of uh, carbon dioxide emissions in Western Europe, to some extent in North America, even though consumption emissions keep rising because of trade of industrial products that are now produced in Asia but are imported in Europe. Uh, whereas uh, economic growth and growth of uh, carbon dioxide emissions increases rapidly in East Asia and to some extent South, South Asia. And due to the rise of these societies, global social inequality, that always depends a bit how you measure it, but is actually decreasing. 
there is a new kind of inequality, uh, but uh, uh, by sheer numbers and statistical terms, the rise of China leads to a decrease in global social inequality. Now, uh, I said this is basically a first step which uh, relates uh, fossil fuel use to the social economic transformations which we already know uh, and which have been analyzed before in terms of modernity or in terms of or in terms of capitalism or a mixture of both now that we have introduced biophysical resources uh, what what uh, changes the account uh, what um, is there anything that uh, we need to add uh, as a consequence of introducing and placing the emphasis and the focus on biophysical resources. Now, um, we can see that uh, authors like Shakabati, whom I've mentioned before, uh, they uh, basically read this uh, from uh, historically from a modernity angle. Uh, there's a sentence uh, in his early article on the climate of history, which is very often quoted, where he says, the mention of modern freedoms is built on an ever-increasing foundation of fossil fuels. This is a sentence which very directly connects the idea of the, the modern commitment, the expansion of modern freedoms, to fossil fuel use. And obviously he does that critically, he says this is not sustainable, that's why we have to get to an end of the modern self-understanding, uh, because uh, we can no longer increase this foundation of fossil fuel use. In the critical perspective, uh, not so much changes actually, because the, uh, there is the, the emphasis on biophysical resources, uh, which I've mentioned before, in uh, work on ecologically unequal exchange and on fossil capital, uh, but uh, it is basically read in the lens of the logic of capital, as one used to do it in that um, tradition already before. Now, what I want to do in uh, uh, the next uh, step uh, in this introduction of biophysical resources in the trajectories of modernity, uh, want to argue that we need actually a fuller account, uh, that it's not sufficient uh, to look at the social economic developments globally, even with this differentiated perspective, um, by uh, adding or complementing it with information on uh, the use of biophysical resources. We need a broader political or political cultural uh, perspective on this ensemble which I've sketched until now. So the question would then be, um, if a major divide happens in North America and Western Europe at around 1900 with the systematic use of oil and gas, why did these societies uh, explore the second vertu vertical frontier uh, in this way and why did this become a major component of the transformation of these societies? Was this done in the pursuit of freedom and well-being? If we, this is partly an agenda for research, but uh, with what we know about um, political debates uh, in uh, the US or in European societies um, uh, in this period, uh, I don't think one can argue that. Uh, the elites who decided at that moment and societies that were maybe de democratizing, but slowly and where the old elites still have the say, they were already free and well off. They didn't need to uh, exploit the second vertical frontier in this way. Was it then because of an accumulation crisis? Uh, partly, that would be, would be the Fordist argument revamped with the introduction of biophysical resources. But um, what exactly, if there was an accumulation crisis, uh, what, what was its exact nature and uh, what was the cause of it? Was it capitalist competition or was it pressure of the workers' movement? Um, there is, um, some of you will know the book by Timothy Mitchell about carbon democracy, which places oil uh, centrally in the history of the 20th century and focuses on uh, the replacement of coal by oil uh, because uh, of the uh, possibility of undermining workers' powers, because the miners were very strong. I think this is more an effect than actually a cause of these developments. Uh, rather, what one can see is that um, um, 
at the beginning of, uh, at the turn of the uh, 19th century, towards the 20th century, we indeed see uh, democratic pressure, which is strongly related to the workers' movement and partly to the feminist movement in these North American and West European societies, and particularly after the First World War with the mass mobilization uh, and after the creation of the Soviet Union. So um, it seems to me more adequate to say that uh, what was done at that moment um, through the social political elites of the time, not just the capitalists and not by logic of capital, is was displacing the problem pressure, which was pressure for uh, full recognition of all members of society and equal recognition. That was very explicitly on the agenda in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, where they were displacing this problem because if they had had to give in to that, that would have radically altered their own privileged position by displacing the problem onto nature uh, and onto other societies due to emigration and then increasingly uh, ex exploitation of biophysical resources elsewhere, uh, not in one's own society. This um, needs further investigation and it will not be easy to investigate at that moment in terms of the reasonings, uh, but we can see this uh, more clearly uh, after the Second World War, where one could argue that the interwar period, uh, the Second World War itself and the rise of uh, uh, Nazism, um, European totalitarianism, uh, showed um, the failure of these supposedly modern societies uh, to indeed um, uh, develop a, a stable uh, uh, a stable path, a stable trajectory. So this was very clear at the end of the Second World War. Um, and uh, uh, then rather explicit conclusions were drawn that uh, these societies could only reorganize, also in the face of the Soviet Union, uh, that uh, if they developed an egalitarian model, which could only be done uh, in a resource in intensive way and by creating firm boundaries between these societies and the rest of the world. This is what is misunderstood as the model of modern societies um, of the 30 glorious years. It is misunderstood because it's not a model at all, uh, because it is based on uh, uh, assumptions that are unstable in the long term, namely the creation of firm boundaries, police boundaries to the rest of the world, uh, and uh, on uh, intensification of resource that of resource use that would lead to um, the reaching of planetary boundaries. I should just add at this point, because this is something we're facing now, uh, there are two moments in this model development, supposed model developments, uh, which are Keynesian economic policies, Keynesian demand management, and the so-called civilian use of nuclear energy. They are part of uh, this whole process. Uh, both of them, uh, well, well, they have been abandoned, we don't really know. They have been temporarily abandoned, at least in the later 20th century, both Keynesianism and uh, nuclear energy production in many countries. Uh, but they were they are forms of displacement as well, but they are displacements of the problem into the future. Uh, in Keynesianism, that is explicit in terms of the deficit financing, where there was a theoretical argument why this should not be a problem, because you could always uh, re repay the debt from the future boom. Uh, and in nuclear energy, in terms of the uh, difficulties of uh, safe storage um, of nuclear waste. So uh, we have there a third form of displacement uh, beyond the one to other societies, beyond the one to nature, a displacement into the future. Now, what this means um, um, is uh, that this is a, uh, a temporary stabilization of uh, one or two, if you want, North America and Western Europe uh, world regions uh, at the expense uh, of other parts of the world and at the expense of nature. Now we can see, and that's why I say it becomes much more clearly then, that during the 1970s, uh, global egalitarian de demands were made, like those for the a new international economic order uh, after decolonization, but they were basically rejected by the West, uh, by their own power. But at the same time in the 1970s, uh, planetary boundaries uh, became part of the debate with the Club of Rome report first. Uh, 
And then we have in the 1990s um, a situation where due to this uh, blockade by Western societies, some uh, other societies, especially East Asian and South Asian societies, embark successfully on a resource intensive trajectory. They accomplish more social objectives than they were able to accomplish before, but doing this, they push further towards planetary boundaries. And that leaves other regions of the globe uh, in what uh, two human geographers, Robin Lyshenko and Karen O'Brien have called double exposure, namely exposure to the negative effects of environmental destruction and of the inegalitarian effects of globalization. Now here ends my, uh, the second part of my presentation. And now I see that maybe I should be a bit shorter in the third part, but I can be there because it is now uh, only a brief reflection on what that means for debates about global justice, especially in terms of biophysical resource use and obviously climate change. Now, if we look briefly back at the debate about global justice before the rise of the Anthropocene theorem, we see that in the modernization perspective, uh, justice was mostly a domestic affair of individual states. That was most explicit in John Rawls' uh, theory of justice uh, and where uh, states, polities, uh, well-ordered societies should organize themselves to get uh, social justice right uh, within their own boundaries. And there is only a very limited duty of, of assistance for what Rawls called burdened societies, those societies that are not capable of developing social justice institutions on their own. And this basically mirrors the first world, third world distinction. Uh, and it uh, also mirrors, uh, it further firms up theoretically, philosophically, the boundaries between the one and the other. Against this, the environmental justice movement from the 1970s, 1980s onwards has already argued. It has argued, you could say in the uh, quasi Durkheimian terms that there is a global division of labor. Uh, so there also has to be global organic solidarity which would develop. Uh, and they focused on, uh, this movement focus, focuses on asymmetry, asymmetry and dependency. Uh, the new international economic order proposal was a part of that, which when it was basically rejected, though the debates formally still go on, uh, turned into a question of um, uh, environmental exchange and environmental justice rather than the broader economic justice. Now, this was before the Anthropocene debate. In the current condition with the Anthropocene, we see that um, both of these approaches uh, are no longer viable. From the, the mainstream approach, it basically means that while before the theory of modernization told non-modern societies that they cannot yet have all of the benefits of modernity, they will have them later. Now, basically, the argument is uh, they can never have them because planetary boundaries have been reached. But the same, uh, something similar is true for the critical discourse. There is a strong focus on injustice, but there is not really an argument about responsibility for justice. Uh, because the whole argument focuses on capitalism, but responsibility is a question of agency and capitalism is not an agent. It doesn't have agency. And because it is an argument that works through denunciation, uh, but not through uh, a strong analysis that could indeed focus on uh, historical trajectories and the agency at work in there. I want to um, just say that I make a jump now to the political debate of our time, but I think you can see the connection even if I don't spell them out in detail. We see today uh, four different kinds of agency uh, in the debate about biophysical resources and how we can use them and who can use them. We have on the one hand, um, the uh, environmental justice movement uh, combined not often very easily with uh, movements like Friday for Future, which have their core in the North, but I mean, there's an ongoing debate that emerges. That's one part. The other part is the debate between uh, existing states and governments, uh, as uh, we find it exemplified in the Paris Agreement uh, and the various climate summits of which we will have one more in Glasgow in November. Uh, there indeed, uh, th there is a mirror debate going on because at least uh, it's a global debate. 
And at least it's a debate in which uh, this principle of common but differentiated responsibilities has been established, which means there is recognition of climate change as a global problem and recognition that not everyone is equally responsible for it. Well, that's where it largely stops, because then when one goes into the detail uh, to say who is responsible for how much and when, uh, it becomes much more difficult and there are refusals and denials all the way along. So these are two forms of agency, but there are two more, and they basically emerge out of the failure to address this question from the 1970s onwards. Uh, there, uh, one form of actor are those states that have shown, states and societies that have shown themselves capable of uh, taking care of the issue on their own. The main example for that is China, uh, which has developed, uh, as I said before, is accomplishing social objectives where one assumed the Western has assumed that China would be a long way away from being able to do that, but it has been doing that by an enormous intensification of physical resource use uh, and thus pushing closer to planetary boundaries. That's the third form of action. The fourth one is uh, migration uh, from those double exposure regions uh, to the richer regions, mostly uh, migration that is not permitted, migration in the course of which many people die, but where nevertheless uh, they, as in a sense rational actors of their own, uh, they see that there is uh, among the options they have, that this is one of the more attractive options despite the risk uh, of dying in the course of doing so. Now what we see here is that these latter two options, they are um, particularistic options. Um, they, are, they are not part of a debate about how globally one can solve this issue. Whereas the first two, the climate justice movement and the Paris Agreement and its uh, follow-ups, they are attempts at doing so. But the, the other two actions, they basically emerge because uh, there is too little consequence of the global debates of the more uh, organized global debates, uh, and especially there is enormous slowness because these debates have started in the 1970s, uh, not only now. Now this means, I think, that we need uh, this kind of uh, historical comparative perspective on the problem uh, for two main reasons. The one is that we fully have to recognize in how far problem displacement uh, has happened instead of problem solving or claiming that displacing problems is a way of solving problems. And we need to look at the mechanisms uh, through which this has been done across the whole 20th century uh, because these mechanisms are still in place. Uh, European societies uh, claim to be ahead in climate change debate, uh, but what we see actually is that they have not developed uh, any different kind of mechanism that would not involve displacement even though they have found out that to the replacement the displacement on nature and on others, there has been growing resistance to that kind of replacement. So the only displacement that many people think remains is displacing into the future, but there the whole evidence we have about climate change is that this is not possible at all. So another way uh, of addressing problems, another mechanism has to be created um, because the ingrained mechanism in our societies will no longer work. That's one aspect uh, why we need historical sociological analysis. The other one is we will not be able to understand the contours of the global actions and debates if we do not understand that political energy, global political energy emerges exactly from the experience and perception of historical injustice uh, that has indeed been experienced in many parts of the world and when the Paris follow-up debates mostly focus on forward-looking solutions uh, where one has to see what are uh, technically feasible solutions um, to deal with climate change, uh, they overlook that without backward-looking at responsibilities for bringing the current situation about, one will not arrive at an acceptable approach, a globally acceptable approach to deal with climate change. I stop here. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I've gone on a bit too long, but I hope there is some time for discussion. No, thank you, Peter. It was really super interesting. I think it would have been impossible to tell such a long story 
traveling through century, centuries in a shorter time. We actually did a lot in a very short period, I would say. Um, I have like four pages of notes. Um, I'm trying to make them a slightly, there are many, many questions um, that came up, uh, as you said, but maybe I'm going to start by the end and uh, push you a little bit more. And I really like this idea that, uh, that you said, well, we have to understand to think that there's always an issue of problem displacement in modernity. So inequality, that it was displaced to other countries, and now um, it's displaced as a, a migration problem. Nature, there is the, 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 when there is pollution, you start displacing it to the global south, and now there is a climate change. So problem displacement won't solve it. We need problem solving. But is it, problem, is it possible to have problem solving without creating other problems? I mean, aren't we falling again into a narrative of coming with a solution that will solve everything? I mean, I think in many ways that tension that exists in modernity will always be there. So when we think, and I, I guess that's going to a more conceptual point when you talk about the work of comparative political sociology and which I also really appreciate. But one of the one of the main criticisms that people would make to those authors is that there's still an underlying assumption of a certain progress that will solve all those tensions. So how can we actually acknowledge that there is no that every solution to a problem create all the problems, but not fall into the trap of always trying to, to not to try to find solutions. And for me, I think this to, 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 to think about this in terms of rationalization, for me, it's very interesting. And in how, when you think about the most recent crisis of rationalization, and, and of course, you, you alluded to the, to the big crisis of the modernity, post-modernity debates, where there was this whole crisis that we should not have anymore, these types of rationalities, and uh, this is over the grand narratives. And more recently, where there is the, 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 the comeback, let's say, of the extreme right and the crisis of democracy, there is a call for enlightenment, again, and a call for science in many ways. Mm. So I would really like to hear you one, one question that for me kept coming back, it's what is the role of science in this, uh, um, in this uh, bio, I'm, I'm trying to remember here the, 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 sorry, I have too many notes, but in the fossil fuel, we need this whole narrative. I mean, can, in many ways at, at certain points of your talk, science kind of appears as with the good guys and in this, this search for liberty and freedom. But on the other way, you could think that it was actually certain scientific beliefs when you think about why it became so important and why it became a solution for elite displacement. Science played a very important role. And now science is the one trying to say there is climate change and we need to do something about it. But so where what is being said and what's not being said and what new types of constraints are also coming um, from these types of narratives. And what I'm trying to allude here is that I think sometimes I'm bothered by uh, science in a way is a realm of uncertainty and sociology in a way, as sociologists, we have to think about uncertainty. And I think in many ways now, both as natural scientists as, and as sociologists, we are being pushed to be certain. And can we actually be certain if we accept and thinking about the whole time topic of, of the of the of the conference, can we be certain in time of uncertainty? And can we embrace uncertainty without sounding like we're being doomed? Sorry for this very coherent thoughts, but it's it's more sort of a gut reaction um, to the many interesting thoughts that you brought to us. And I'm going to stop here, otherwise I'll keep going reading my four pages and it's not my keynote. <laughs> Thank you again. I'll give the floor back to you uh, before we come up with some uh, reader questions from the Q&A. Thank you very much, Graciela. Uh, these are some um, key elements um, uh, where indeed um, I'm glad to have the occasion to say a bit more because I wouldn't like to be misunderstood about them. Um, First of all, the, in the order in which you mentioned the issues, um, problem solving without creating further problems. Um, 
you know, the tension will always be there. Um, the uh, maybe I mentioned when when I was um, investigating also, and I was looking for concepts um, uh, with which to grasp what I thought I was observing. Uh, I indeed um, uh, encountered the earlier uses of uh, the term problem displacement. Um, maybe you, the two of you are probably not Luhmannians, so you will probably not be aware of that, but Luhmann used the term, and he uses it posit positively, uh, because he says, I mean, th that's what you have to do. If you encounter a problem, that basically means you live in a situation uh, where you cannot go on. That's what we call a problem. So what you need, it is, uh, to use a visual metaphor, he doesn't use that, I think, uh, it is as if the problem is somehow in front of you and you can't move on, so you have to displace it uh, to be able to go on. Um, so uh, this is an interesting use of the term, but it's, um, and it is maybe what is actually happening uh, very often, but it's uh, not positive at all, uh, because it basically means it allows you to go on on the trajectory where you already were, and you don't take in at all what the problem maybe means for you, whether you shouldn't uh, deviate from the trajectory where you were on and go somewhere else because this obstacle is uh, in the way. Um, and there, I think the, I mean, I think you're entirely right. We will not be able to develop a concept of problem solving that from the beginning uh, is able to avoid problem displacement. Uh, I mean, that is, the, that is my position that I use the term problem displacement as something that we should not go on doing, uh, not like Luhmann, uh, but I do not think that we can have uh, a prior concept that allows us to do that. And I think exactly for that reason, um, well, that is what I try to work on, is indeed to um, uh, rewrite the history of the 20th century uh, as a history of problem displacements and the um, uh, partly catastrophic consequences uh, which, has, which that has had to make us aware in the present that we might be doing something like that again in the way we are dealing with what we today perceive as problems. But that is not, there, there is not more than we can do than to raise the awareness of the fact that whenever you try to solve a problem, you may just be displacing it. And uh, I mean, not always the consequences are worse than the problem that was there. Uh, sometimes there is progress in that sense, but um, often it is, and we can never rule it out entirely that the consequences are more severe than the problem we uh, faced first. The, I think I see your questions actually uh, related. Uh, this, um, um, certainly it relates to the question of rationalization. Um, and um, there, I think, in the strong use of the term um, in Enlightenment philosophy and the whole tradition of that philosophy until, um, until the present, uh, it is indeed often used as if rationalization leads to a, a superior kind of knowledge, uh, where indeed obstacles are moved out of the way. Uh, I think actually, if you look in practice, uh, this, uh, this conception prevailed only at uh, moments which I think one can identify. I mean, you have that problem in the um, world of work and labor uh, with the Taylorism, uh, where there was this assumption uh, that indeed you can rationalize work and after all, everyone is more productive with the help of fossil fuels, which uh, not many people were thinking of that time. And then we have this again uh, after the Second World War in the whole also planning debates and rationalization debates as if one could rationalize the whole society. But at other points in the history of the 20th century, in practice, I think uh, many people in all walks of life, uh, even politicians, uh, business people, they were well aware of the fact that you couldn't rationalize everything away so that um, uh, that you wouldn't have this superior uh, superior knowledge. The, uh, it indeed, uh, I think, but the, 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 the issue there is indeed, and that is maybe more pervasive and also something which we have in current climate change debates, uh, namely the assumption that even though we may not know it when we start, that there always is due to our creative, innovative capacity as human beings, there is knowledge 
in principle uh, available uh, that we only have to find and then we can solve the problems. I mean, this is something which um, at the end of the Second World War in the US, which was called Science, the Endless Frontier, uh, so that uh, the, the notion of endlessness is important there, that indeed there is no boundary uh, to our knowledge. Uh, there may be planetary boundaries, but there is no boundary to our knowledge. And if you think of geoengineering and things like that, they use that idea. We only have to step up our knowledge and we solve this issue, like we solved everything else before. But I think that's profoundly wrong. And the problem there is that when we talk about knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge, but not only, what we uh, what is always given preference to, I was inclined to speak individually, but let's be more careful and let's say social politically, is that knowledge which is seen as enabling is seen as allowing us to go on apparently in a better way. Whereas the whole uh, environmental debate from the Silent Spring and the Club of Rome report onwards uh, was about, uh, uh, it was about knowledge, but about constraining knowledge, which was telling us, well, not every knowledge we can have uh, will enable us to go further. There is also knowledge that points to boundaries. And in fact, this knowledge tends to be ignored. Uh, social politically. If you look at what happened to the um, limits to growth report, um, it may have been right or wrong, however you look at it now, uh, but uh, it was meant as a warning. There are planetary boundaries close ahead. What it actually triggered was uh, the development of new uh, discoveries of oil fields and extraction of resources uh, because people didn't want to believe that there is a constraint. Uh, so we have to push further. So in that sense, the, uh, you're right in saying that um, in the course of the reflection I'm arguing for, we also need to uh, think about different kinds of knowledge. Uh, and that leads me to your last question. Uh, I think the, uh, I will be short about that um, because maybe there are more questions and I'm taking up much time. The, uh, I think the most interesting debate currently is indeed the one which does not use the opposition, uh, which you were rightly referring to, namely which points out that uh, science is about uncertainty. Uh, we may be neo-positivists or not, but we should all recognize that what we consider a scientific finding now uh, may prove to be wrong tomorrow. Uh, and I think the people who are working in the IPCC, they are very well aware of this issue that uh, everything they say, they say with a high degree of uncertainty. Actually, they always, they try to specify how big the degree of uncertainty is. <laughs> of course, they cannot. I mean, that's a, an impossible endeavor. Uh, but nevertheless, at the same time, in the political debate about this, uh, they and many others try to convey the certainty that we're heading for catastrophe if we don't do something about this. And there is a tension in there. So in that sense, uh, science is about uncertainty as much as sociology is. And maybe, um, uh, well, we are now supposedly in Geneva, uh, but uh, you may know Helga Novotny, who was in Zurich for some time. She published some years ago uh, a book which is called The Cunning of Uncertainty, where from a, from a science studies perspective, she emphasizes that what science is about is coping with uncertainty rather than eliminating uncertainty and creating certainties. I'll leave that as an answer to your third question. Thank you so much, Peter. I really, I mean, I, I'm, I keep taking notes. <laughs> Julian, do we have questions? We have one question from the audience. Maybe other, other questions. Don't hesitate to write it down or if not, I will uh, read the question from uh, Marlene Saken. Uh, I quote, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I have two questions. Uh, one is clarification. Can you say something more about the false manifestation of global justice linked to migration? Are you suggesting that migration from richer countries are facing, uh, sorry, are forcing countries to react to compound crisis? That's the first question. And the second question is, uh, is there not another form of justice emerging linked to the notion of displacement into the future? In Wales and in some other country uh, regions, there are efforts to represent the future in democratic processes. 
through the creation of a commission for the future that are set at that are sit in parliament. Do you feel that examples of participatory de democracy that account for the future might be another way forward? Yes, uh, thank you very much for those questions. Um, uh, what I was trying to say was um, that uh, if we look globally, uh, look at global justice indeed, um, and not accept the limitation of strong justice concerns only to um, things that happen within our boundaries, uh, then I think there are um, these various kinds of agency which we can observe. And I think I want to underline that because maybe I was not clear about that. Uh, I think the, um, uh, the, the, the environmental justice movement and the um, uh, intergovernmental climate discussions, um, they, um, let's start with the intergovernmental climate discussions. Uh, they started in 1972 at the Stockholm summit um, and it took them an enormous time to take off. Uh, I mean, there were there was goodwill, uh, I mean, for instance, by the Swedish government at that moment, uh, but uh, to reach any kind of common understanding, not to speak of measures to be taken, uh, this, um, it was not only about climate, actually, it was not about climate change then, it was not in the focus, but in general about planetary boundaries. Um, uh, but it was basically only under the Kyoto Protocol, uh, or maybe if you look at uh, the Montreal Agreement about um, chlorophyll carbon gases, uh, that indeed global action was taken. Um, so this is, and this overall have, has been a process of uh, denying the urgency of the matter by uh, the majority of the governments involved, and especially the most powerful and the most polluting governments. Um, let me stay with that. Um, let me leave the environmental justice movement out for the moment. Um, now, I think that um, even though there is no direct connection, uh, but what we see, uh, we have seen since then, uh, increasing consequences of this lack of action, lack of global environmental action. Uh, and um, not only environmental action, because I think the uh, global social inequality and uh, environmental uh, uh, issues, they are closely related. I mean, they, one can see that in, in many connections. This double exposure I was mentioning is only one, one focus on this. The, um, these uh, two particularistic actions I mentioned, I think they are in an indirect sense, a response to this inaction in concerted action, globally concerted action. Uh, and this is the rise of China, and this is uh, migration from the south to the north. Uh, because, um, and, and the difference is that in one case, you have societies and governments that have determined uh, that they are able to take care of themselves. Um, and, and this is not capitalism, because uh, China may be capitalist in some way, but uh, it is basically the Chinese Communist Party which has determined that and has found this it's capitalist strategy to do this. Uh, but it's extremely resource intensive uh, and thus uh, exacerbating the problem at the same time as it solves other problems. The other is um, people fleeing from deteriorating social and environmental conditions, uh, maybe especially in Sub-Saharan Africa as the, the key example, but also in, in the Middle East where war uh, is added to this. Well, there, is also, there are also kinds of wars in uh, in Africa. Uh, and this is also because of uh, the deterioration of that situation due to the inaction um, that takes place. Um, if you analyze the Chinese government strategy, you probably even find this if one has access to the documents explicitly. If you look at the migrants, you don't find that explicitly. Uh, but I think um, you uh, also because of the, the longer periods where individuals, uh, you cannot trace them over longer periods. Um, but um, the experience of injustice is also there and that if no one else does something about that, we have to do it ourselves. In the one case states and the other case individuals or families. And so I do think that this is, these are social processes which are reactions to inaction at the other level. And that is what I wanted to say. Um, and I do think that, uh, let's say you could also call it just a starting hypothesis, but I think we could confirm it in detailed research or already available research reading it in that light. Now, 
uh, what you suggest as an alternative, in a sense, is I'm in full agreement with that. Um, and I think these two other strategies, they only exist in this radical form because of inaction. Now, if we go to the other, to your alternative, participatory democracy, uh, this is exactly what we should do. Uh, but we need to do it uh, all the way along from uh, assemblies in Wales to then coordination of uh, the United Kingdom government, as long as it remains united, uh, to uh, higher levels and global consultations like uh, in the follow up of the Paris Agreement. Uh, I think that is. I don't know whether it's possible, but it's necessary, so it needs to be done. Um, and uh, I think there are elements, indeed, your example is very good, there are elements in other parts, uh, what we, we can see from close up in Europe, where we see this, but it needs much more momentum uh, to indeed be able to change a global situation. I hope that answers somewhat your question. <laughs> Yes, definitely. There is a hand raised by uh, Ibrahim. You have the floor, Ibrahim. I think you have to unmute yourself if you want to talk. Maybe just... No? Maybe he raised his hand by mistake. Ibrahim, are you there? <laughs> well, while we wait, maybe he will be able to unmute himself. But I wanted actually to follow up on something also related to this idea of the transnational and the national. Because I feel, and maybe I will be picky again with the comparative political sociology, because of course, this is a the whole field of studies is very much based on the nation states, right? A lot of the, the macro comparisons are nation state. And, uh, and now one of the big changes with the, the whole debate on climate change and everything is that it needs to be a transnational policy. But of course, we know that it's impossible to have the transnationality without the states. So within this narrative, and of course, that brings the idea of democracy, right? Do we have to respect the democracies of each national unit? Mm -hmm. Can we think about a, a, a democratic space that it's more open? I mean, in, one, in some of your papers, you cite the very interesting uh, case, I think, of Ecuador, and when they try to, to sort of propose a bill to say, okay, you want us to preserve our forests, you have to pay us. And then when there was not really a concerted in, in a transnational level, he went ahead and, and did the, the exploitation. So there are, there are interesting initiatives at the national level, but there are also the ones like Bolsonaro, they are completely destroying the Amazon and really not uh, giving any space. So how can we think about those issues, bringing together the importance of the national states, but also the transnational. How can we think about that correlation in a way that it's not simply saying, falling again, oh, the right is the Paris Agreement and the, and the Western European countries that now are pushing for the environmental agenda, or falling to the narrative like the ones from Bolsonaro or another um, even left with governments that are basically saying we should not pay attention to that agenda because it's unjust to us to fall back into the, the language of injustice. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a big question, but it's very dear to me, so I'd love to hear you on that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let, let me answer in two ways. One very precise, if you want, and the other one a bit grand. Um, the precise way is, um, when one looks at the um, global environmental debates, uh, this principle mentioned before, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, it emerged in these debates. Uh, it is uh, a global justice principle, which completely emerged outside of political philosophy. So political philosophers were struggling with this, and they couldn't come up with anything like that. It came up practically. Um, and indeed, in the early times, it was even, there was a clear criterion for differentiation, namely that what one then still called the developed countries, uh, they, uh, as historical polluters, they are responsible and have to pay, whereas the developing countries don't have to pay because um, they have only suffered from this. Now, uh, so this, in a sense, was fine. 
but of course it was not acted upon. And um, uh, due to what we have been discussing before, the situation has changed. There are now countries that used to be considered developing countries, which are high level polluters. So um, the discussion has to change about uh, how to um, interpret differentiation. Uh, but uh, the problem is that if this continues along the line of inaction, then we always keep reinterpreting the principle without ever acting on it. Uh, so there, there the debate has to advance. That was the precise point. The vague point now is the one, and let me, uh, since it's probably the last words I'm saying in this session, end on a positive note. Uh, actually, this morning in the lecture, um, Karl Polandi's great transformation was referred to. Uh, many of you will know this book. I only want to recall this one element when he uh, looked at the historical responses to the ravages of uh, the idea of market self-regulation in 19th century Europe, he said that the responses, some of which turned out to be problematic, but it was what he called the self-defense of society, it emerged from two sides. It emerged from social movements, most importantly, the workers' movement and the unions, uh, and from the side of governments um, which recognized that uh, they couldn't go on like that. Even highly conservative authoritarian governments like Wilhelminian Germany with Bismarck. Um, so uh, there was what he called, what Blani called the double movement. And this indeed brought things about which would end in the egalitarian European welfare state, which I have argued before is not a model, but it solved the problem temporarily uh, by displacing it. Uh, I underline that. But at least we can see there uh, that uh, if we now look at um, uh, the IPCC uh, and the environmental justice movement, these may be the two arms of a new double movement, uh, which also would have to come together uh, because the governments on their own, without pressure, they will never solve this because they will keep delaying and denying um, and not agreeing simply also. Uh, whereas the movements, they will not be able to solve it because uh, they are unstable, they are non-institutionalized, they have stronger moments and weaker movements. So one, and these things can take some time, hopefully we have that time, but uh, it is in conjunction of these two elements which have in common that they indeed recognize the commonality of the problem and want to address it in the adequate global manner. Uh, that uh, from there something positive can emerge. Um, so uh, that maybe is the prospect and also the direction one can work on. And the Wales assemblies, they are part of that, obviously. They are also an interesting moment because they have a movement component and they have an institutional com component as well. Uh, they are almost by necessity locally confined, but uh, in this response, in this since the self-defense of the socially viable planet, we might call it uh, paraphrasing Polanyi's self-defense of society, something can emerge in this combination and conjunction. Thank you, Peter. Don't know if you want to add something, Julian. No, no. <laughs> so thank you so much. And thank you especially, I guess, to uh, oblige us to finish on a, a a, pos a, posit a positive or at least slightly optimistic note, because I think we are in need of that. Mm -hmm. So thank you. We wish we could invite you now to join us for dinner. That would be great, um, but hopefully not next time. And maybe it's good for the planet that we are <laughs> in the virtual mode. But we do, as all contradictions and dualities, we have mixed, feel mixed feelings about it. So thank you again, and I hope we'll be in touch and be able to meet in person sometime soon. Okay. My thanks to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was my pleasure. And yes, indeed, I hope we can continue this discussion in one way or another. It needs information. So I hope we'll be Definitely. able to do that. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Everyone.